Hi guys, Jonathan here again, taking up more than the whole table with another huge historic firearm to show you. Uh, now, if you were trying to guess what this is over on Instagram or Facebook, I suspect a fair few of you have said Patton 1853 Enfield rifle or rifle musket or rifled musket. Both of those terms were used on both sides of the Atlantic, confusingly. And uh, by the way, they're not, they don't mean anything different at all. It's, it's just a, a language thing. So rifle, rifled musket and rifle functionally all mean the same thing. Uh, rifled musket and rifle musket imply something longer that takes a bayonet and is rifled as opposed to a dedicated infantry rifle like the Baker or something of that nature. But uh, without getting too much further down the rabbit hole of, uh, of etymology, call it what you like. Uh, <laughs> this isn't it anyway. This is in fact the pattern 1851 Minier rifle. I've only ever seen it referred to in the official documentation as the Regulation Minier Rifle. So that seems to be its formal name. What's its relation to the Pattern 53? Um, it's pretty similar, except that it's more similar to the quote-unquote brown bess smoothbore musket that came immediately before it, the Pattern 1842. So we'll get into that. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll show you a, a P42 in a moment just to to emphasize. So this is actually a collaboration that we're doing with Real Time History, who we've worked with before on the Franco-Prussian War. You might remember uh, that if you've been with us for a while. Um, this time they will be dropping a big and no doubt very good documentary on the Crimean War, which I'm very excited about. And they asked us if we would like to choose something to do a companion video on. And the logical thing for me to choose, given that there is precisely one video on the whole of YouTube that covers this thing. Uh, very good, by the way. Um, <laughs> paper cartridges, check out that channel. They are shooting the thing uh, at some distance and showing how, how capable it is. Um, perhaps we can do a little bit more on, on, the, on the historical side here. We, we aren't shooting it, I'm afraid. These are, these are quite rare. Uh, we don't have that many even here at the Royal Armouries. Now that's Pattern 53 Enfield, I think is, well, it's better known in Britain because of its, it does appear in the Crimean War, but not until 1855. So the majority of the conflict, 53, to right through to the end, actually, most soldiers are armed with this, the Pattern 51 or the Minier rifle. So it's the sort of forgotten um, main British infantry rifle of that conflict. The P53 is known because that's what a lot of the... the Units like the Guards regiments were equipped with that in the Crimea. They came home with these, these shiny new, improved, um, still Minier type rifles, but um, now with the, the moniker Enfield rifle. And also the American Civil War, I think, weighs heavily on this era of history. And that was, you know, the P-53 was used in that. So people, people know the Enfield rifle. They don't know this. And of course, this did not serve for all that greater length of time. Only, I think, a total of 34,000 were ever made, which, given the, you know, the size of the British Army at the time, is not, is not huge. It was enough to equip all of the frontline regiments with one of these. Well, what is one of these? I keep talking, keep using the word minier. Um, so just to introduce, if you're not aware, the basic idea. So this is a musket ball, 0.69 of an inch, which was the regulation size. Um, substantially smaller than the 0.75 bore of the old brown vest, the flintlock brown vest. Um, and this is not, in fact, the mini bore for, the, for this rifle. This is a uh, P53, an early-ish P53 type bullet, but it does illustrate um, the key features here. Um, you can see that this is the wrong one because it's, it should be. This is 0.702 caliber, the weapon, um, from land to land, whereas you can see this thing in my right hand is substantially smaller than the old musket ball. So whereas the projectile diameter for this thing was kept the same as the old musket ball. Now if you elongate the bullet for a more aerodynamic shape, which is, you know, in large part what this shape is doing, it's, it's referred to as cylindroconoidal, so sort of fancy Latin derived language for a cone with a, uh, sorry, a cone on top of a cylinder, basically. So that's the basic shape. And the critical aspect beyond its more bullety shape, <laughs> as it were, is the K 
cavity in the base. So the true Minier bullet, and we'll have to see if we can uh, find an example um, for the future to preserve, because I don't have one to hand, that cavity is critical. That is filled with hot expanding gases when you fire the rifle and the sides of the bullet expand out slightly enough to grip the rifling and be spun. Why? Well, that means you can ram the projectile down as quick as a musket ball and shoot it out as accurately as a rifle bullet. So it goes down smaller, comes out bigger. That's the basic idea. Now, that concept was, well, it's contested. <laughs> so there was a Captain Norton in the 1820s. Uh, there's um, William Greener, the, the famous gun maker in the 1830s. He actually submits a form of this expanding bullet to uh, the War Department. Uh, of the Board of Ordnance, I should say, and they tell him to go packing, uh, paraphrasing that, but they're not impressed. They, they think this is a, I think the word they used was a chimera, a sort of Victorian language for get the hell out of my building and take your not musket ball with you. And yet within not that many years, we see a version of this thing come back. Only this time, it's got the Minier name attached to it. So that's Claude Minier. Um, and as a Captain uh, Delvine, associated as well. So Delvin came up with the, so the, in parallel probably with Norton and Greener, the, the timeline is confused. I don't want to pick sides. Um, so we start with the Delvin form of expanding bullet. Uh, Minier adds a, an iron cup to that hollow in the base that I mentioned, which is initially at least thought a more efficient way to get it expanding and gripping the, the grooves. So early days for this form of, of projectile. It's pretty key for mid 19th century warfare. I think it's hard to understate how important the, the reach and penetration you get from a Minier rifle. You know, suddenly you're punching way above your weight, um, albeit only for, for one shot, and the reload, the reload is slow. As we covered in the Franco Prussian War video for real time history, or clip for their video, um, it's, it's, it was sort of horses for courses. You know, the, the, the needle gun was quick to reload, great at close range but it lacked the legs to go out to long, me, medium to long range and, and you know, do terrible execution is probably the phrase they would use. Now, if you come and visit us here at Leeds, at the, the, the main Royal Armouries Museum, you will see two of these Minier rifles on display and they have, I'll just show you what's not there on this one. <laughs> this one's nice and intact, but both of them have had musket balls or rifle bullets potentially strike their, their muzzles. One of them, it's gone straight through both sides, which is pretty exciting. We can show you a picture of that, but I think best you come and see it for yourself. And then another one where the bayonet was fitted and that's given it a bit more sort of armor effectively, and it hasn't gone all the way through. Um, so check those out. Those have definitely been <laughs> in a Crimean war battle. This one um, probably was in the Crimea uh, because apart from sort of generic wear and tear, which it's, it's hard to, to pinpoint to any particular action or date, we do have on the butt here, as well as the, the rifle number of 105, above that we have 42, which will be the 42nd Regiment, 42nd Highlanders, the famous Black Watch. Uh, now the 42nd Regiment have uh, included in their battle honours the battles of Alma and Sebastopol, so highly, highly likely given the relative scarcity of these things that all of them went out, this would have been in the hands of a soldier at one of those battles, which is quite exciting. In terms of the technical aspects, it's not overly ambitious. They're playing it safe in some respects. It's set up, as, as we say, or uh, stocked and, and kitted out, very similarly to the P-42. So this, if I put, we'll put them side by side so you can see them on the, the overhead camera. I think you can see that aside from the detail, this is a rifle version of this. So percussion locks are basically the same. Uh, the, the percussion barrel is much the same and the bore hasn't changed very much either. This was deliberate. This was chosen so that in a pinch you could use round musket balls in your modern Minier rifle. Um, in reality, it was found that it was after a few, after I think 12 shots, it was too difficult to get the bullet down there. But if it was only an emergency thing, then maybe 12 shots would be enough. 
Um, that was slightly unfortunate as a choice because it made the thing heavy. So we have um, a, th a thicker barrel, essentially, to, to be able to inc uh, incorporate rifling grooves, essentially, and that makes this thing heavy. This is over 10.5 pounds or 4.8 kilos. It's a bit of a beast. But then the P42 is, no, is not exactly svelte either. Externally, very few differences. So this is basically George Lovell's design. Um, he was the, the chief inspector of small arms at the time. And most of the weapons put into service carry his sort of aesthetic, as it were, uh, including the Lovell bayonet catch, which is this sideways, I'll show you on the rifle, uh, this sideways spring catch, which when the bayonet is fitted, I can't fit it all the way because these were fitted to individual rifles and this does not actually quite fit this rifle, but we slip it over the front sight, just like a, just like form, uh, muskets of uh, earlier times. You'll notice though that the front block here by this point is shaped like a sort of barley corn front sight, as well as being a locking point for the bayonet. Rotate it round and then you would slide it all the way on. I won't do that because it's super tight. Um, and then the catch would snap into place over this ring. So it's not, it can't possibly go anywhere unless you depress the catch, pull it forward, twist, pull it forward again, and off it comes. Hard to, to, underst to, hard to overstate, rather, the importance of the bayonet at this time. Uh, in fact, a lot of the resistance to this new infantry rifle, um, or general service rifle, regulation, mini A, was based on the idea that if soldiers could shoot from further away, they wouldn't charge up and stab the enemy with their bayonets and we might lose battles. That was a, that was a genuine concern from some quarters. Um, so that was a, that's a, a Lovell feature, good old George Lovell. And then the overall setting up of this with flat keys, we call them. These, they're shaped like this on this side. And then they just, they're just flat strips of um, iron or possibly steel that pass through the lugs that are on the bottom of the barrel. So this is a this was a step on with the P42 from the old um, flintlock brown bess iron pins that you just drive through and drive out every time you need to take the barrel off. So um, I think borrowed from the sporting gun world. So that was that was an improvement. Uh, the bayonet catch definitely an improvement. Um, Otherwise, it's you know, fairly minimalist furniture on this, brass butt plate, brass trigger guard, and it all carried over from the P42, but you'll notice P42 has just a simple rear notch sight, big upgrade for, uh, for Brown Bess. Substantially could increase your accuracy if you had the skill and if you had a good musket. And then down the bore is just smooth bore. This is why, at the time, this was still called Brown Bess. Um, I've got a, a long, tedious article on this and a hope, hopefully less tedious version on the internet that you can read that explains where that nickname comes from and why it was in probably its biggest use around this time, 1840s, 1850s, because that's when they're setting this aside wholesale, almost overnight, in favor of the, the Minier rifle, at least for frontline troops. So by comparison, I mean, the, you know, the lock mechanism and everything is, is much the same, but we can show you the, the nice markings on the lock plates. Usual Royal Cipher, date 1852. That's when most of these would have been made um, and then issued. Uh, VR, of course, uh, is the cipher. Various uh, ownership slash ins uh, and inspection marks on this thing. Nothing too surprising for the era. Nice to see them. That's how you know it's a, a military piece and not, say, a trade equivalent. Although I don't know of any trade equivalents to the Mini A rifle, uh, whereas there are lots for the P53. Um, so, big differences, as noted, that front sight. And then you should hopefully be able to see the rifling grooves. They are shallow in a Mini A rifle because of the way it works. You're not having to force lead into grooves. Well, you are, but the, the explosion in the barrel is the burning, the deflagration <laughs> is doing it for you in the breech. So you don't need deep grooves. In fact, you don't want deep grooves because it's, yeah, 
going to be harder. You, the explosion itself won't be able to fill the, the grooves by forcing out the, the skirt. They need to be shallow. So that's four grooves, and it's, uh, it describes a twist, i.e. the twist rate, is uh, one in 68 inches, which is quite significant. Uh, muzzle loaders always have a, a slow rate of twist. Um, this, in theory, didn't have to have such a slow rate of twist because you're not having to force the ball down the grooves, twisting it as it goes. That's the that usual sort of reason for not having a, a fast twist. Um, then again, in terms of external ballistics, of stabilizing that bullet in the air, you only give it as much twist as it needs. You don't need to over-stabilize it. Um, and it's harder mechanically to, to cut a tighter, faster groove into the barrel. The other aspect is the, is the rear sight. So that U-shaped notch is gone, of course. Not, well, not quite gone, because we have a, a V-shaped battle sight for 200 yards on top. I'll see if I can line that up for you so you can sort of see, get an idea of the alignment. And then, so that's a 200. And then you flick this up. And I don't know if you can see the markings on there, but it is graduated all the way up, all the way up to a thousand yards. And normally when we see a thousand yards or meters for that matter on a, on a rear sight, we sort of scoff and say that's, you know, optimistic or maybe it's for engaging um, or, you know, scaring the enemy or harassing the enemy or something like that. Well, yes, that's, that bit's true. But these things uh, and the P53 that came after more so genuinely could reach out to that distance and have an effect. You know, if you're attacking a formation of infantry, you're definitely going to have the chance of hitting something. There are accounts, uh, again, with the P53, which is a bit better than this, but still, people being struck at seven, eight, nine hundred, and even a thousand yards. Now, who knows who, which, which of the three guys they were aiming at when they hit the one on the right, but you, know, you get the point. You could put the bullet out to that range and still have an effect. This is why that term effective range is so nebulous. Um, on a normal sort of, you know, it, it's fascinating to think, I think, that the normal sort of effective range of three to 400 yards or meters, for, for quite often quoted for a modern rifle, even if it's capable of putting a bullet out to 800 or more, apply, this is, this is the first time that really, really applies. You can definitely, a normal soldier can reach out and kill somebody at three to 400 yards with this thing. Definitely. So that, that's your true effective range. But a good marksman can definitely go beyond that. So the thousand yards setting is just the top, and you can see that's that would. In fact, if you check out the paper cartridges video, you'll see see them shooting at getting on for that sort of angle. So almost like an archer um, aiming aiming up to correct for the drop of the bullet. It is a big, heavy bullet, um, but then the increments are controlled for with a with a slider. So it's the first time we really see sites like this coming into use. So you can just set, I can't see what I'm setting it to, but you get the idea. There's a, a nice connection here with uh, Arthur Wellesley, Duke of Wellington, who is commander in chief of the British army at this period. Um, he dies late in 1852. So he, he lives just long enough to sort of see this into service and put his formal seal, seal of approval on it as it were with a caveat, which I'll come to in a second, uh, before he then uh, passes away. So this is, he, he lives long enough to, to see off Old Brown Bess, um, which he was a big fan of. He, he was a huge fan of, um, of that as a, as a type of weapon and thought it was good enough, uh, was not convinced necessarily that there was a need for every infantry soldier to have a rifle. Um, he was of the view, uh, as many were, that uh, rifle regiments were fine you know, guys in green being all stylish and hiding behind trees and stuff. Um, but not the you know, good old Tommy, um, I don't know you calling him Tommy then, but the British soldier w should be just a stalwart chap who would stand there in bright red and deliver fire and march, and that's all he needed to worry about, load and fire three rounds a minute. Well, he did come round to the idea. Um, the Marquis of Anglesey is said to be the, the main sort of well, one of the main movers on this, and also the guy that persuaded Wellington, I think twice, I believe Wellington decided to withdraw his approval for the Minier rifle and then reasserted his approval. Uh, now, the condition 
was that it, it, he apparently went through crossing out the word rifle from the initial sort of drill training notes that, that were drawn up, uh, explaining that he didn't want the regular infantry to, to have, to effectively to have airs and, and become conceited was the phrase he used and um, think that they should be wearing green or some other jack -a dandy uniform was, was the amazing <laughs> phrase that was used. So he's, he's progressive enough to realize that yes, you can, you know, why not extend your range, fire three volleys where before you could only fire two or something, which is how these were really used early on, other than by riflemen or the occasional skill shot in the regular infantry. Why not have that capability? It starts to open out the battlefield, which we see happen um, you know, to a ridiculous extent, essentially in the First World War. Uh, the empty battlefield concept is, is sort of born around this time but at the moment, it's just a, it's a sort of force multiplier for them. And he, he sees the value in that. But equally, he doesn't want the, the regular soldier to get any ideas. Now, that's not to say that the, the British uh, Board of Ordnance was not paying attention. Um, there were trials in 1850. We've covered this, uh, or touched on this before, with the British-made Dreiser rifles that we showed previously. Um, check out that video. Um, they were, you know, doing this sort of regular, every few years, they would, they would see what was around and, and carry out a trial to make sure that what they had was not being outclassed too badly. And so there was an initial round of trials in, I think, April 18, uh, 1850, involving the French uh, Carabiner Tige, which was a sort of pillar that squashed the bullet. You squashed the bullet onto the pillar that expanded it that way. And uh, against you know, the, the standard British um, Brunswick rifle, and a few other designs, including these Dreisers, and they decided, yeah, we're kind of okay. But then only about a month later, they heard about the new French and Belgian Minier, or Delvin Minier, Minier Delvin pattern rifles. And they had Lovell go around gathering up and having made a load of rifles to test. So a second round of trials took, took place in spring 1851. So the development on this was, was pretty rapid, and you see why they kept most of the design features of the Pattern 42 musket because the time frame is quite compressed here. And that trial did include uh, both a French and Belgian made Minier. Uh, we do have in the collection what we believe to be one of those, uh, to be that Belgian Minier, and that was the one that was favored over the two. Now that does not look like a Belgian or French service rifle. In fact, I think, believe there was an 1841 model um, for both French and Belgian armies. We're a bit lacking in that area here, funnily enough. But we do have this very British looking, but Belgian made mini rifle that is essentially the prototype for this thing. So we'll, we'll, we can flash up a picture of that for you as well. So the first prototype is essentially a copy of that Belgian rifle, albeit without the back action lock. So instead of having a lock plate hanging out the back here, as the, as the Belgian submitted design had, uh, it, it reverts to the classic P42 style of lock, i.e. conventional lock plate. Testing with that must have gone well because they then commissioned 500. So that's a, a sizable sort of troop trial of the time. And then we actually have some, some stats, which is nice, comparing how this thing did against the existing service weapons. So we've got 500 rifles equipping 10 regiments at the time for troop trials. So at 100 yards, the Minier rifle hit the, hit the target 94.5% of the time, compared with only 74 0.5% for the Brunswick rifle. So this is the, the two-groove belted bullet rifle that replaces the Baker. Then it's the current British Army rifle. Only the rifle regiments get it. Um, and it's not as good as this thing. So a dedicated rifle is not as good as the new um, rifle musket, if you want to call it that. Um, or just musket, as they insisted on calling it then. Uh, at 400 yards, it was 52.5% for the new rifle and only 4.5% for the Brunswick. That's remarkable. So this thing is way, way better than what we already have and can be issued to everybody. And you've still got the length to fight off cavalry or do whatever you need to do with the bayonet, which is always a concern. So um, broadly speaking, at 150 yards, the Minier rifle is twice as accurate as the smoothbore musket, but it gets better at range. So at 400 yards, it's 11 times better. So it, it's calculated. And between 300 and 600 yards, it was also calculated that the, the that 150 men armed with the Minier were doing as good work as 525 with a musket. 
So real, you know, the, the term force multiplier is a modern one, but it applies very much. Now, this wasn't just more accurate and, and longer ranged and proportionately a lot more accurate. It was more devastating as well. So in trials, we had uh, the penetration of a, of a um, wooden target, deal, a sort of hardwood, um, at 250 yards, five and a quarter inches, whereas the musket ball only went 2.9 inches into the same thing. Now that's in wood, people aren't made of wood, and accounts from um, the Crimea, at least two that I've seen suggest that this thing could go through two or even three Russian soldiers. Now historically, we, if we have any information about effectiveness, it's usually very one-sided, but um, in this case we seem to have some reliable information from the Russian side. Um, there's a Colonel P.K. Menkov who's quoted as saying that whole regiments melted before their stutzers, being a German-derived word for rifle, uh, losing a, a fourth of their number, I believe, the, I believe the quote was. Now, there's a slight context to that in that Menkov was trying to get rifles for his own units. Um, and the best way to do that is to point out that you're losing you know, a quarter of your men or whatever to the latest uh, wonder weapon. Um, so there's a sort of political-ish uh, reason for him saying it, but that doesn't mean to say it wasn't true. You know, the, it stands to reason that the, the effect... If, if you have standard Napoleonic tactics, essentially, suddenly... What, you know, more, far, more shots being fired more accurately, of course, uh, casualties are going to go up if you don't yourselves have the rifles to fight back with. And so, you know, these guys are using smooth bores against the latest rifles. So I'd go so far as to say this is the most successful British military firearm for its length of service, because you're looking at, well, four years? <laughs> four years of service before this thing is, I don't believe, even relegated to, to like second line use. It's just gone. So considering how successful it was and how critical it would have been to the British success in Crimea, um, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty significant historic firearm. Um, so if you'd like to see more about the context around this, definitely check out the real-time history documentary that will be very soon available for you to go and check out. Thanks so much for watching, guys. We really appreciate that. Um, if you'd like to come and visit us at one of our three sites, please do. We always appreciate um, physical visitors as well as digital. And you can check out our various social media uh, channels, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, also, keep an eye on our website well, and the socials as well because we have a joust coming up, um, one of our big events that we're known for here at the Armouries. They're always a good time. Either way, however you engage with us, we'd like to see you again next time.